Um, I'm John Anderson, I'm from the Peak Media Sweden, um, and we, I'm the executive director there. Uh, we have been working with you in 80s for quite some time now. Um, we have been, uh, since uh, 2016, I think it was, we started having uh, John Cummings working at, uh, as a uh, Wikimedia residence at UNESCO. Uh, we were co-funding it with the Wikimedia Foundation for these, over those years. Uh, he was on loan from us to UNESCO, um, really trying to, to establish like a presence of Wikimedia within the UN agencies, and that was kind of the, the first uh, real efforts to, to get the UN aware of that the media as a thing and that they could, you know, work on with us. Um, between 2000 and, um, you know, 21 to 23, uh, we kind of expanded that work from, you know, focus, focusing mainly on UNESCO, as because UNESCO has a very unique role within the UN agencies. They are the ones being tasked with promoting open access within the UN system. So they, you know, they are very, very important to have on board in this kind of work. Uh, but we kind of scale that and, and have you know, been thinking about a lot of different ideals uh, into government organizations and how we can approach them and how we can work with them. Uh, what I will be doing like in this presentation is these kind of five areas. I will you know, kind of round it up with a few questions. I have some questions to you. Uh, if you have questions to me, we can do that. But uh, I will start kind of like, you know, what are we doing? Um, you know, what kind of similarities are there between the Wikimedia movement and the UN agencies? What are the opportunities that we see? Uh, I will go into a few examples of the current work we've been doing, uh, just to give you kind of understanding what kind of things are possible with UN. Uh, that's not to say that that's the only things that are possible, but that's some stuff that we have tried and tested and that we feel was quite interesting and could be scaled. Um, move into that, to future opportunities, and of course, how you can engage. Because um, there are, there are you know, these, these are huge organizations with enormous resources and, and you know, we're talking enormous staff, enormous amount of content, enormous uh, reach. So there are like, and they are global in scale per, per definition. Uh, so there is definitely an opportunity for all of us. Um, and what we've been trying here is really to kind of open the doors. And to understand like, uh, you know, why we have been engaging in this work is, you know, as the community of Sweden has had like a, an understanding of that the movement need to um, have some support functions that are currently missing to be able to do, do different type of uh, partnership scale. Um, we have been investigating for quite a few years now, you know, the possibility of forming what we call a content partnership hub. Uh, it's a kind of thematic hub in the movement. If, if you, are you guys aware of what hubs are in the media movement? So it's part of like the 2030 strategic recommendations that we, what the movement is going to develop into, that we're going to have a more um, equitable uh, movement that is going to be a possibility for more affiliates to take a larger role that's going to be trying to move the uh, decision making power from kind of this very central organization the media foundation to different other entities and, and thematic and regional hubs are two of these kind of structures uh, thematic hubs are focusing on a thematic area so for example glam, glam or content partnerships uh, and that's kind of what we've been focusing on or to be a regional focus that they are focusing with you know, with west africa there is a, maybe a regional hub or, or Central Eastern Europe, or Europe might have a hub. Uh, and they're going to try to support the local community in different ways to be, you know, find areas where there is currently no activities or, or currently are no support being given. So how can we like find those spaces? Um, and over the years we have been trying to see like content partnership or glam partnership is something the movement is super good at, right? That's something we all have tried and it's kind of an integrated part of most affiliates. But we all, every year when we meet in these kind of events and activities, we see that some things hasn't changed. There hasn't been like improvements. We, 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 we see the same kind of problem spaces uh, staying every year. Uh, because it, these problem spaces might be, um, you know, they are international in nature. There's no clear ownership. There is no, they are costly to handle. Uh, so it's like it takes a long time, term investment to solve it. Um, and, and, you know, that it might need, um, um, like some, some organization to kind of, build up the capacity around that to be able to coordinate and, and you know, uh, engage the affiliates across the, the movement to, to work in that space. Uh, so what we did, we did a, like, kind of a large needs assessment in this space. We, we had interviews with around... Can you please ask you, could you please slow down a little? Oh, of course, sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> really kind of you. Okay. Uh, of course. Uh, please, please raise it again Thank if you. I speak too fast. Uh, so we, we tried to do a needs assessment, uh, but we tried to interview uh, yeah, we interviewed 50 aff uh, affiliate members that are working within the Glam 50 space and we asked them, you know, what are your needs, what are your issues, what are the stuff you're doing, what would you need more help with to, to move your work further. 
um, we try to like ongoingly in integrate this uh, these insights that were shared with us uh, on how you know in, in different areas concepts that we call it um, where we could be doing valuable work as a thematic hub where we could be um, adding something to a uh, services that are missing in the movement currently and, and these are kind of the five areas where we saw there was strong needs across the globe so not just in Europe or just not in Africa but like across the globe we saw some some problems faced uh, we saw that there was a need for um, hands-on support people people are often working by themselves and they're in context and they they have expertise in some area they are really good at doing um, you know convincing their partners to sign an agreement but they don't know then how to work with, with batch uploading the material that they get out from it or they might you know for the opposite situation or they might be really good at training so they are missing kind of like uh, the knowledge on how to explain copyright um, and, and all these kind of things that they really might, might be working with one type of institution but not the other type um, and they want to have insights of their own duplicate work they don't have to start from the beginning and stuff so the help desk is basically like a one place where people can call in really like to, to get support um, and, and I'll be talking about that tomorrow morning I have a presentation around the help desk and, and where we'll be sharing like how um, how we're trying to approach that and how we are trying to create working groups where people can, can engage in that work and not so it's not just we need a Swedish staff being the help desk but it's a, a global effort um, I would be, now today's presentation I'll be talking with the, about the IGOs and the UN agencies this is a problem space that a lot of uh, affiliates are talking about that they are really like they, they see these big organizations that are out there they just don't know how to get, them, get in contact with them so like they, they know there is these regional offices of the UN in, the, in their country but how, how do we get the conversation going how do we enter that, that discussion uh, how do we engage them how do we get things started um, so this is what the presentation is going to cover like you know, a little bit on you know kind of openings we're trying to create in this space uh, strategic data uploads that's focusing on uh, really like having the data sets that we all need to be able to do, uh, do good partnerships uh, working with structured data on commons or working with like uh, data sets that are just like the information about where the glamour students are in the world so that we can contact them easily and, and reach out to them software development uh, you know we need only tools and, and, and uh, infrastructure that is functioning um, so we have been investigating like, what we can do as a thematic hub in this space, uh, either with giving support to volunteer developers that they want to develop, they have developed great tools but they don't know how to maintain it over time, or they are, um, they are kind of, a, uh, the tools are, can only take us so far, these small tools that are creating on a hackathon, but we need more, uh, more advanced, more robust tools that are better integrated into our platforms, um, which is a much bigger uh, thing to do on board. Uh, and then of course the task of building where we're talking about uh, how do we uh, we're not talking really like how, how to get uh, to create material that is missing not about writing a report or a case study or, or um, you know like a information sheet uh, or creating a MOOC or something like that that is something the movement is already doing great work with uh, what we're talking about here is more like what is the infrastructure that is missing around that how do we identify what people need the help desk is one facilitator for that. If we get a lot of requests for, you know, uh, we have this problem. If we keep getting that, that same request, we probably should create some capacity building material from that. Uh, and just being able to identify that and, you know, coordinate with other affiliates so they can take on that work uh, is, I think, a valuable output of that. But also, like, if we have identified a bunch of material from the help desk, saying, like, here's, um, you know, a lot of material, these are the case studies that exist in the movement. Uh, around you know how to work with a modern art museum. Uh, okay, well that information is if that's spread out on ten different places, you know yeah we can provide that information to the people asking for help at that time, or we can structure that information so people can find it more easily. Um, so that's also like a, a service function, you know, like you have that um, that infrastructure so that you you structure that kind of um, thematic content in different ways. Um, and also like these kind of more networks and exchange programs and these kind of things, which are also uh, quite costly to set up but not that costly to uh, run. So like these kind of areas that we, we kept getting requests, these are missing in movement, someone to put it up. Uh, none of us as affiliates had had the resources to kind of go forward with that, uh, but the thematic hubs, uh, in theory at least, could have the, you know, the, the strength to do, uh, take on some of these tasks. So the really like, what I'm trying to point to here is that all of these tasks are attempts where we are trying to build services to enhance collaboration and, and capacity uh, amongst affiliates, but 
it's really not about taking over anything that's already being done. It's like trying to find the, the holes, the missing pieces in the puzzle, and trying to put focus on that, and, and trying to develop those kind of services. Um, as I said, we've tried to develop these kind of five concepts to this point. And we have a pretty clear idea about, based on our needs assessment and the work we've done, what we could be doing. And the next step for us is now to see how can we um, you know, really create engagement around these so that it's not Wikimedia Sweden staff doing this, but it's the wider volunteer community and, and affiliates uh, representatives. And I can create those, kind of, those um, co-working spaces. Really. Um, and of course, the governance part. Um, I mean, Susanna here in the room is you know, part of our, our expert committee on the help desk, uh, which is one way of moving power from Wikimedia Sweden to decide what we cannot prioritize. If we get a lot of requests to help us, we shouldn't be deciding it, it should be the community, and so we have an expert committee around that. But that's just one example, like how do we do the bigger uh, governance issues? And that's something we are now kind of switching our focus to, because we, we felt that we need to have these concepts so people can understand why is the value in a thematic hub? And is it just gonna be a bureaucratic uh, thing on top of, it, of everything that adds no value? Or is it gonna steal things from us really, like the work we're already doing? And uh, by having these concepts, we think that it's uh, much more clear what opportunities uh, and why is it? why it's worth to invest in this. So, like I said, like, UN and the IPO work is part of that. Am I, is my speed still too fast, or is it okay? <laughs> yeah. It's fine, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, the, with the IPOs, we've seen like, there's this really nice overlap, where we see that uh, the mission from the UN agencies is really that they want to share material with the general public. They want to inform the public, they have a mandate to do that, they have a, you know, a, a stated mandate, they should be doing this. It's just really hard for them. Because like, they produce all these beautiful, beautiful reports that have a few hundred people reading them. And like, that's not where they want to be. They want to reach out with the material. They are thinking from the start, global. They are thinking from the start, uh, multilingual. They are, you know, from the start, they are thinking like, what is, like what, what is the most needed in society right now? Like what is strategically important information to get out to people? Like all this stuff is what we're talking about as well, right? We want to have, you know, multilingual content that is global in nature, that is uh, of high impact areas, uh, high, high topic, uh, topic, high impact topics. I mean. uh, and like, so we have this kind of perfect match. Uh, and especially like the, the UN agencies are, are working a lot with the sustainable development goals. They are trying to really like, um, try to enhance it and move forward with them. And that's something that the media movement has also taken upon ourselves too, that we are really interested in, in that work. Um, so what we see here is like, they, they have all this interest of getting material out, but they don't really know how. We've, we have presented them with the media platform, so as a way of doing that. This is exactly what we've done with the Glamis students over the years, right? It's, it's nothing really revolutionary with that, but what is really cool is that they are really understanding now. They are really at a point where UN agencies do want to share their content. Uh, because they want to have impact. So, you know, so they, they do have a huge amount of content, um, and that co kind of content, they, that really spans from these kind of uh, statistics that they collect globally for different purposes, that, you know, every country supply them with different statistics, and they have these uh, beautiful data sets available that are global in nature, all kind of things, to, like, these specific reports about uh, different, you know, interest areas that they have. Uh, that are prioritizing. Um, they are also, um, you know, like really like of global relevance. They, they as I said, they are, um, th this is content that per definition is covering more than one geographical area. Uh, the only time where it's not really that is the case is when there's been like a catastrophe, like mm -hmm. the earthquake in Haiti. There's obviously going to be a bunch of reports about Haiti or different aspects of that. Uh, but then again, it's probably of global relevance because it's such a big event or the, you know, Ukraine-Russia war, you know, like there's a bunch of reports coming out because of that, or COVID. Like, you know, they, they do try to, you know, uh, really like produce content that are really like uh, value uh, at any given time. Uh, but they also follow up on it, so, which again, it's a similarity with the media movements. They, they don't just like produce news. They also make sure that a year later, there's gonna be a follow-up report kind of analyzing what actually happened. And that material is also, of course, super valuable for us to then work actively to integrate onto the Wikimedia platform. So we all don't end up with kind of like these, you know, uh, latest events, articles that are, haven't been updated, but we really have, have qualified, uh, quality certificate, certificate information. Um, what we've tried to do so far, we've really tried to focus on three areas, because as I said, they have information about pretty much anything. 
and, and we were just like, we have to start somewhere, we have to limit down the focus, and we have to have a more clear ask from them. Uh, so we focus on climate, gender, and health. And those are the three areas that we decided, as an initial pilot, this is what we should focus on. Uh, just to showcase, like, we, we felt that this area is where the community is quite active. There is a lot, not just in, in our context, but globally, there is a lot of interest in these three areas. Uh, there's a lot of momentum, there's a lot of other partnerships happening where this can cross-pollinate. Um, but we also felt that, you know, again, this is a starting point. We, this, is, we, this is the experimental part. Uh, we, we're showing a path here what we could do. Those thematic areas is not where we have to end it. That is something, again, to decide to the larger community, what should we be prioritizing in these, with these partnerships. Um, so what has happened, like, you know, if we're so, such a good, good uh, uh, fit uh, or good match, um, well, what we've seen already is that, you know, there's not just Wikimedia Sweden doing these kind of partnerships with, with UN agencies. We see Wikimedia affiliates across the world that are, you know, having local partnerships, often with the regional office, for example, or the, the local delegations, uh, and which is really, really interesting and fun to see. Um, they, they, we've also seen, like, that because of the work that we've done with the, the headquarters, that they are really, like, starting to put in a lot more priority into this, so that these regional offices are starting to talk with more affiliates. So we see that this is kind of um, going through the UN uh, agencies uh, and really like creating opportunities already for local affiliates. Um, because we, you know, we have been able to have these discussions at a high level, we have been able to provide them with, with hard data, what is like, what is output with this? Because we've done a bunch of pilots with them to show like, what can you get out of this? What is the impact we work with the big media movement? What kind of, you know, what kind of success stories can we create? And we have created a few of those, uh, um, and uh, you know that's uh, I think it's already shown results. But there's definitely so much more work to do. There is also you know uh, again like you know we've done a bunch of experiments to showcase stuff, but it, that's just the starting point. And, and uh, there is so much more room for uh, like for for improvement and for innovative experiments to do together. Um, so, like, if I'm moving to the section where we are, like, what we have been doing, just to give a few examples. Um, like, one of the main challenges for, for us is that even if there is an opportunity to, to work with uh, a UN agency, uh, we are small organizations, most of us, volunteer-driven in many, many cases, so it's hard to kind of, like, uh, scale that work and, and to really, like, um, encapsulate in, like, one little event or something like that. Um, so, what we have been trying to do is, is uh, create the, the kind of agreements with the UN agencies that allows this to be um, kind of what we had a discussion in the previous session. Uh, how do we ensure that this is not like a one-time event happening, but it's something more, more regular and structured? Uh, so we're trying to like form agreements with the memorandum of understandings with the UN agencies so that they want to work with the Wikimedia so that the, the local Wikimedia affiliate can show to the regional office, hey, this is like a thing. Uh, we are prioritized by the head, head office. Uh, you should probably talk with us. You know, a way to open doors. Um, we have, like, again, as part of the content partnership hub, we've been trying really hard to see what we can do with with content from them. So the material that do back up those of, of you know targeted content uh, to see, you know, like as I said, within the, these three themes: uh, gender, climate, and uh, uh, crisis. Like, can we? Can we, can we showcase this material and, and work with volunteer communities to uh, add this material to different, um, to different Wikipedia articles, to um, enhance it in different ways, to, um, um, you know, in, in different ways, of, or like to, to open up for uh, communication efforts around it together. Uh, we have done this with you know, a number of different human agencies. A um, few of them are listed there at the bottom, and there's actually a few more than that that we have initiated talks with. But we, we, as I said, we see like super strong interest from the UN agencies to, to work with the Wikimedia movement. And like I said, we've been like trying to do content uploads. We've been trying to do establishing partnerships, and we've tried to create structures for Wikimedia residencies. And uh, these, I think, these things are all kind of like now creating a, um, an environment where, where local Wikimedia affiliates can really start doing activities together with either with the content that is already available or work directly with the UN agencies because they need some other type of content. They don't care about these three themes, but they want something else. Well, then you can engage, then you have an opening to engage directly. 
Um, so just giving you a few examples of what we have done. Uh, the um, Office for the High Commissioner of, uh, High Commissioner of uh, Human Rights uh, has, like, they, they, they are pretty niche organization, or niche part of agencies, uh, but they, do, they are very central to the place, and we tried to find a way of working with them. And what we came up with together with them that was that we wanted to see if we can find uh, missing articles about women that are human rights defenders. Uh, so we, human rights defenders. So like we ask them to like you know uh, we are we are organizing Wiki Gap every year and we can, you know trying to get people to write articles. Uh, can you provide us hundred articles that are missing in this space? And they were like, yes, this is super fun. Let's do that. So they got together. They worked on that for a few weeks. Uh, they're experts in house, and they provided us with this list. And this you know we added this uh, list of women that are missing articles uh, into the Wiki Gap uh, challenge, and uh, we saw like a. A thousand articles being uh, written in, in four different languages, and that kind of like impacted that we showed them that this you, you put in the time to identify missing articles. We we saw in the problem as a movement after this. That was pretty impactful. They they were really like Im impressed by that and saw that okay, well this is something we could be doing. It's it's not that expensive for them to do. They can have some the staff that are already paid in house that are already experts that want to make sure these uh, these women in this space is. Uh, highlighted and then get visibility, but, you know, do the prep work. Uh, it saves us a lot of time as organizers of the Wiki Gap Challenge. It's, uh, for them, it's a great opportunity to, like, put forward uh, great people uh, that should, should get more visibility. Um, we work with uh, UNESCO and uh, uh, the national delegation at UNESCO. So at UNESCO, the, each country has a national delegation connected to it. They basically have an ambassador at UNESCO headquarter. And they are really like keen to have, um, you know, different. They, 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 if you, can, we had the opportunity to present to them, like, we are interested in getting information about what kind of build cultural heritage do you have in your country and what kind of values do you have in your country. Can you provide us data sets of this? Can you talk with your national um, offices uh, or national agencies to see what is out there and is it under CCC or license? And they were like, okay, this is really interesting. So like, they, they uh, had a lot of contact with their home, you know, with their, their national institutions and, and tried to figure out what is out there. Because we didn't really know, uh, you know, in, in a lot of countries, we don't have those lists. If there hasn't been a Wiki Lab Monument contest happening there, we, we are unaware of the, the material that is out there. Um, so this was a great opportunity to just like, really like opening doors because like, the, the national delegations, they were ambassadors. They're not going to do the work. It's not like they're going to provide us with a list. But they are knocking on the door saying, hey, the media movement is really important. Uh, we, we've been hearing about them at UNESCO headquarter. Can you start talking with the local affiliates and see if they can provide some data sets? Where, you know, it's, it's hard for us to track how much impact that it's had, like how much actually led to them releasing data sets. Uh, but we know they've done the contact. We've gotten emails from the national institutions and we've been able to co connect them with the national teams. Um, so, you know, it's like one of those like, kind of long-term uh, opportunities. If you, if you get into those rooms and talk with these people, they are, like, you know, important enough to actually make change in the countries. Uh, at scale, and, uh, and this is probably a global scale. I mean, we had, like, 70 people, 70 ambassadors in our, like, for our presentation. That is pretty impactful, I would think. Online or in person? In person. I think that's kind of important, yeah. Um, and we have been invited to do that next year as well. So it's, it's pretty interesting. It's super warm in here, right? It's not just me, yeah. Okay, you can open the window. Yeah. It'll be great. No, I'm not from here. I'll open the window, see. Of course, we've done what we are very. Oh, no, that didn't work well at all. Uh, work with uploads of files, media files. You know, this is something that we've done a lot as Wikimedia Sweden. Over the years, we've done these batch uploads. Uh, it's a very frequent thing in our organization. Um, this, again, we can, by doing that, as, as, as these kind of uh, initial uh, case studies, we've been able to show cases like just how impactful that is. If they decide to release a material under a CC0 license or a CC by or CC by SA license, what kind of impact they can get? Um, We've also done uh, a lot of work with the reports because we've, like some of them do have, you know, um, like image collections as well, like so we can do the batch uploads, 
Many of them do not have them as separate files. They have them as, their, their publishing offices have them as, <laughs> we're up on that again. Uh, their publishing offices, they, they have it as, uh, um, it's part of the report, right? So they, the report might be 100 pages long, and it's, it's going to include hundreds of images of them, or, or graphs, or different types of material. And uh, so we, we talk, uh, and this was also something that they owned. So like in, in many cases, like with data sets, it might be national government that actually have the copyright to them. So they have not signed an agreement between the national agencies to like who owns the data in them. So they cannot release it then. But when it comes to reports, they have cleared everything. They own everything, they own every image. Uh, so we, we started discussing with them, can you then release these reports on the free license? And, and pretty much all of them are like, yes, we can, totally. This is definitely within our, our ability and, and our power. Uh, but we kind of start with a few, and we're gonna see what happens. So we work with them to, to really like bring um, bring these these reports to the movement. Uh, seeing how like this kind of like uh, enormous reports could be broken down into uh, different um, you know smaller sections that they, their staff help to identify. Like these are these are areas that are missing in current Wikipedia articles. So they did kind of the peer review of the Wikipedia articles. Said here's the missing pieces that we have in our reports. We break out that text and we provide that to the Wikimedia community. Right? This is a lot of work for them. Uh, but again, this, the impact to them is huge. Because like we, we did with, I think it was 70 reports uh, from, uh, no, we had uh, 70 Wikipedia articles from uh, FAO, FAO reports. Uh, 600,000 uh, views on those articles per month. Oh. And you know, when their reports get a few hundred views usually, of course the people reading that is like decision makers, uh, it's the, journalists that this research they it was, for them this was super cool mm -hmm. um, so they were willing to do this kind of really like hands-on help like no they're not editors they have, in some cases they are sometimes they, they had someone at their office actually doing the edits but often just yes, like to be able to give us this kind of very clear input so the volunteer community can say okay well this this fits or we need to rephrase it this way but that's a lot less than trying to read a hundred page report and try to identify it you have like you know 75% of the work is done uh, by their paid staff. That's you know, a pretty neat way. Uh, we did the same thing with UNESCO, uh, 330 articles, 6 million views per month. Uh, so you know, then they had an intern that they kind of engaged with this, which you know, has its issues because of that we of course provide training and support, but you know, you have a newbie trying to do stuff, it's not always easy and it's not always welcome, uh, but you know, still like a massive impact. Um, you know, a number of other uh, UN agencies uh, have shown it to do this, and we've been trying to work with them. Too. Um, we've done some really like interesting uh, work with the uh, Internet, uh, International Energy Agency uh, in connection to the Russia-Ukraine war, where as soon as Russia kind of rolled in the tanks to, to Ukraine, they were like, okay, this is gonna have a massive effect on, on um, uh, energy in, in the whole world, right? So we need to start producing reports around this. They were like, from like pretty much day one, they kind of stopped everything they were doing and like started producing reports around this, like how, how this war would affect energy uh, dependencies across the world. And, and they wanted to um, get this information out there, of course, because like th this is like all the newspapers are writing about it, at least in Europe, that was the case, you know, uh, about this every day. And they're looking for information, but it's like hard to find it in their database, right? Uh, so they, they broke out these, these graphs that would be suitable illustrations for the existing Wikipedia articles. And, uh, you know, uh, with our help, reach out to the community that here are these, these newly developed graphs that are like, you know, uh, top of the line from our, you know, respective source that you can integrate into the Wikipedia articles. The online community across uh, multiple uh, language versions did that, and, and, you know, so it really got out the information that they were spending so much time and effort producing, uh, which was really cool. And, and again, like, this is such a fast turnaround. We're talking like, you know, in, in February uh, to like May, they have, you know, they have switched everything that's producing these graphs and reports regularly, and, and we are getting them onto the platform. It's, it's not a long turnaround, and we hadn't really done much with them before. We had discussed with them, we had, you know, created an interest to working with us, but we didn't have a, like a ready-made plan. But then it came like, by the ownership, here's like, here's great stuff that we have that you might want to have. So, so really like a strong win-win. Uh, we've done a lot of partnerships with UNESCO around uh, the photo contest that we have. You know, they have uh, these multi-million uh, follower accounts on, on social media. Uh, they've been helping to promote that over the years. 
to all these contests. Uh, they pr pr provided prizes, so like you know, signed books about world heritage by their you know top officials in the in the UNESCO, for example, which is like, you know, a pretty cool prize to get. Uh, these nice books that they you know have in their uh, their store anyway, so it's not the cost of them to send it out. But it is a nice addition to the, the contest. Uh, but especially like communication uh, and like just you know visibility for the for the contest. It's not a content partnership per se, but it's it's uh, you know. The content partnerships that we had with other organizations to get the data, some of this enhanced in such a way so that it, they see the value of working with us. Uh, again, opening these doors that I'm talking about with the, um, the national delegations so that they were actually communicate with uh, We also had this really cool opportunity. We produced uh, 30, uh, like a photo exhibition with 30 images that was hanging outside of UNESCO headquarter for, uh, I think it was four or five months. This is the, the wall outside of UNESCO headquarter. Uh, this one here is the United Nations headquarter in Geneva, uh, where it moved for another four months after that. Then we had it uh, like produce a smaller version of it that was we sent around to, uh, we had it in Italy, in Sweden, and uh, Canada. Uh, photo exhibition that was out in you know, different public institutions. Uh, this is images from the Kilas monument, uh, or images that are um, considered like the best on all commons that we had you know, handpicked together with their teams, made sure there was uh, global coverage, because uh, that's super important when you're working with the UN agencies, uh, work on, on like, these descriptive texts, uh, and, and like, you know, also like, a whole slide of this where we asked about the Commons. comments. Uh, that's hanging on the UN offices, like saying, this is, you know, in, in multiple languages, like, you know, this is a platform that you can contribute to, and you get this kind of visibility. It's, you know, how much would you pay for that as a, you know, as a PR, like, opportunity? Uh, this is central Paris, you know, a whole wall <laughs> covered with, with our, our content. Uh, so it's, you know, a, a nice opportunity for us, a nice way of highlighting the, the Vlamiki community's work, um, and, and also to, you know, um, really, like, engage with them in a different way. Different part, because, again, these UN agencies, they are so big, uh, so, you know, in, in this case, we could work with the, um, the uh, World Heritage sites, we could work with the, the groups that was working on um, illicit trafficking of, of stolen goods, uh, underwater heritage. These are all groups, like these are, these are like, uh, <laughs> these, these are all different parts of the of UNESCO that some of these I had never been in contact with before, but by doing this, them knowing that it's gonna go up on the walls uh, outside of their, you know, their office building, you know, they take tax like, and, and it's getting prioritized. And you know, everybody wanna work with the World Health, uh, sorry, the, the World Heritage uh, Team there. They are like, the, everybody's, you know, pulling their arms because you know every every country want to have more world heritage sites in their country. So you know if you get it put into the room and actually talk with them about it, it's it's, it's a big deal, right? Um, so it was a it was a good 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 way of like again um, deepening the partnership. Of course training staff that's a I mean an obvious one. Um, you do want to do that of course and, and you probably want to do that in a uh, quite frequent way. We've done it in two ways. We've done it with Again, some, uh, some people are forerunners that are really active uh, in their organizations that have seen the value of Wikimedia for whatever reason. They come to there like, ha, ah, this is super cool. We should do something around this. So really like trying to give those people a lot of our time and effort and really like trying to um, work with them very deeply uh, so that they you know, get the kind of uh, power in internally to, to push these questions and, and give them space to do it. Um, so like they, for example, the, um, when it comes to the reports, for example, that's it. There is a, a network for all these agencies, uh, for the heads of publication, it's called, the ones that are responsible for all these reports. They come together a few times to do it. So we show up there and we present about this and we talk with them and they, we co-present with the people that have done the most of this and, and you know, they can showcase how, how far ahead they are from the rest of them and that's really inspiring for the rest. So at each of those events, we get a bunch of requests to do work with new, new agencies. Um, but, and I'm coming now to the kind of the, one of the areas where we would really need more help from the community. On top of working with all this material, uh, one of the best ways of working with them we've seen, and one of the things that they want the most, is to have the comedian residence in their institutions. They want to have someone that is there available for them to ask questions, to work with all the departments, all the units in their organization, um, that can help them with all these kind of gray areas and or you know, difficult decisions, and, and guide them if they're gonna have to change the policy. So they really want someone that is available, uh, you know, much larger extent than we can do as staff members in Wikimedia Sweden. Like we can help answer an email with a week delay. We cannot like be there within five minutes when they are knocking on the door. Kind of. um, 
So that's kind of the next steps. Like, you know, we want to work with different affiliates uh, and different volunteers to, um, to really get this material out there. See, you know, all this content that they are willing to share already or, or have already shared is on our platforms already, but not being used. You know, we want to make sure that uh, the higher visibility we get of that material, the more, in, the, the more impact we can show with that, uh, the easier it's going to be to convince the rest to continue working with us as, uh, um, as we move forward. And, and that is a really, like, I think, a, a powerful opportunity to help with that. Like, you, you can organize an editing fund in your country, and, and if you can get, like, you know, 50 of these images being used, that's <laughs> because we have such high visibility on our sites, that's going to pull up the, uh, the view count in a, in a way that, you know, might tip them over. So you can really, like, do a very concrete thing quite easily and get a really large impact, because you might get a UN agency that changes your policy. Um, again, like, the regional offices, like, since we are signing these agreements with them centrally, which is basically saying, we are prioritizing the work with the media movement, we want to, you know, engage with you, uh, we need to engage with them, right? We're not going to have, we don't have staff enough to do that with 10 different agencies. It has to be locally owned. It has to be um, activities that happen in, uh, in, in the different countries, in different places. So again, like, you know, you can do it with uh, uh, material that's already there. You can talk with your regional office or your local, you know, the uh, UN office that might be in your country. Uh, or you can contact us and we can maybe put you in contact. If you have a good idea, we can be there to point to, to reach the right people within the UN agency. Um, then, of course, the, the, comedian residency, the comedian in residency positions. Like, the thing there is that um, we, we do see quite a few requests from UN agencies. Right? And we're talking like double digits here of UN agencies that want to have a comedian residency in their organization. In many cases, not all, they are willing to pay for it. So they are willing to, you know, really like pour money into the Wikimedia movement, which is really, really amazing, right? Uh, but how do we do that? Because like right, right now, we don't have that many people that are competent at Wikimedia in residence. We don't, they are mostly from Europe and the US. Uh, they, they are mostly made. Like there is like, you know, we have a pretty small pool to look into, um, which we think is a real problem. Because uh, they are really looking for, uh, they often have like a, what, what we've seen so far, they want someone from a certain geographical region that speaks a certain set of languages. Like, it might be, you know, East Africa and French. And, and they don't want uh, a person from Sweden coming here. <laughs> like, they want someone from East Africa speaking French. Uh, and they want to work with the French language person, that's the first thing, but really like, again, like global and multilingual is the, uh, the end goal, but they want to start somewhere, right? Um, but right now it's very hard for us to identify those people. Um, and we need your help to do that. And like, again, like, uh, we, we, we want to do that because we want to ensure equal opportunities. And we think that if we can do that, we can provide this kind of a larger set of people that are uh, interested in doing this kind of between res residency positions that can really like open up opportunities. Uh, we do need to have that identify the people, uh, but we also need to do the training for them. Because again, this is not the same as a glam institution. A glam institution is, you know, they have a national focus, it's pretty easy to understand. These are huge, complex organizations that have, you know, they, they are like in the center of diplomacy. So they are like every, you know, conflict that you're thinking about, they have to take into account. You know, if there's ongoing wars, they, they will have to make sure both sides are represented at, in the material they share, for example. Which really like adds so much complexity when working with them. It's not easy. And you need to be aware of that kind of stuff when you become a new community residency, because you can't just like pick your five favorite images and then they're gonna be like, it's going to be a big problem, it's not a positive thing. So, uh, they need to, it's the whole process of picking this kind of material and stuff. Um, we need to provide training, and we also need to provide training for more people so we broaden the pool of people. Uh, so that is like something that we are really looking into right now, is how can we provide this kind of Wikimedia residency training package. Uh, we are hoping to do that with a number of Wikimedia affiliates that already have Wikimedia residency trainings, uh, so they're not starting from scratch. Um, and, and then, you know, provide this opportunity for people to go through these trainings and then actually get a job from it. Uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, at least, you know, for six or six months or a year uh, to work for a human agency. Which, again, like, this is such an opportunity for us as a movement to, to have people to produce content and, and generate, like, new content for us. But it's also, a, 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 I think, a possibility because if we have, like, people that get this kind of work experience to work in these really large, powerful organizations, uh, get the network from it, 
they have, you know, they, they go through the training and learn how to do this. If they are then, uh, if we can work from the beginning to connect them to the local affiliates, uh, that's a huge win for them because they, they might be staff members for them in the future. And if there is no affiliate in this region or in this part of the world, uh, this could be the first staff member. Like you would have someone on the ground that has, actually has tangible experience and a network already. Uh, so you think it can be like a really like kind of powerful engine to, to um, like uh, create opportunities for, for the movement, also financially and like you know capacity wise. So that was my my field. Uh, that was the things I wanted to say around this. Um, I'm, I'm really curious if there's anyone in this group that has worked with uh, human agencies. Um, yeah, two people, yeah. Would you like to share a little bit about the experience? Well, I will just briefly tell that we run the uh, Wikilogical Heritage campaign. We started with the local focal point. And uh, we, in fact, did not work with the So what we've seen to this point has been like because we had this very strong and long going partnership with UNESCO, um, which again is tasked with, with changing the UN agency. There, there's, a, uh, there's a decision from, from the Secretary General that the UN should open up the conflict. Open access should be the norm. But how do we do that? It's all these you know, steps to take. And UNESCO was tasked to implement that. And we've been working with them you know, for many years now and, and we have a very good working relationship with them still. Um, to, to promote that, uh, and that's something that has been going on. So that has really like created these uh, the, the willingness to open up uh, is there, uh, and of course there's a discussion like with any partner, like what does this mean, and what are the risks that involved, and what are the benefits. Uh, so that's why we put in such a focus to do these initial uh, pilots to be able to show what the benefits are, and when they see that, the, the they of course. Um, take risk in consideration, but it, that they also can see that it's about so we need to consider it seriously, uh, which makes the discussion much more friendly from the beginning, right? Um, and I think we've been, 
we've been able to like convey that message.